I could publish two pieces by Phil at the Times, and uh, the thing I really loved was uh, uh, about him when I first met him is we had some kind of captioning thing going on because he provided pictures uh, uh, for this uh, incident that occurred, uh, in a, uh, and uh, and uh, so we were trying to work on the details, and he said, I said, well, you know, how can we figure it out? And he says, I can be there in a half hour. So he actually rode his bike, you rode your bike, right? Yeah. So he actually showed up at the Times, came and sat with all the editors and producers, sorted everything out, and then it was on its way. But I, I thought that was kind of cool. Like, you know, usually when you work with writers, they mail it in, you know. He didn't mail it in, he actually showed up. So. Uh, I thought that was very military, and uh, it was good <laughs> to meet him uh, so early on in the process. I usually don't get to meet these guys too much, and, and girls too much after. Uh, Phil Kai is a Marine Corps veteran of uh, Operation Iraqi Freedom and a graduate of the MFA program at Hunter College. His work has been published by the New York Times, the New York Daily, Phil put the New York Times first. <laughs> <laughs> uh, just a thing. The New, York, the New York Daily News, Granta, and elsewhere. Forthcoming as a story in Fire and Forget and a short story collection to be published by Penguin Press in 2013. Phil Klein. Thank you so much. It's, uh, I think this might be the first reading I've done where the Marines out uh, outnumbered the Army, uh, which is excellent. I'm used to us outperforming the army, but um, <laughs> just kidding, Roy. Uh, so this is the the beginning of the short story that will be in the story collection, assuming that I finish it uh, on time. So it's called Bodies. <clears throat> For a long time, I was angry. I didn't want to talk about Iraq, and so I wouldn't tell anybody I'd been. And if people knew if they pressed, I'd tell them lies. There was this Haji corpse, I'd say, lying in the sun. It'd been there for days. It was swollen with gases. The eyes were sockets, and we had to clean it off the streets. Then I'd look at my audience and size them up, see if they wanted me to keep going. You'd be surprised how many do. That's what I did, I'd say. I collected remains. U.S. forces mostly, but sometimes Iraqis, even insurgents. There are two ways to tell the story. Funny or sad. Guys like it funny with lots of gore and a grin on your face when you get to the end. Girls like it sad with a thousand yard stare out to the distance as you gaze on the horrors of war they can't quite see. Either way, it's the same story. This lieutenant colonel who's visiting the government center rolls up, sees two marines maneuvering around a body bag, and decides he'll go show what a regular guy he is and help. The way I tell the story, the lieutenant colonel's a large, arrogant bear of a man with fresh pressed camis and a short, tight mustache. He's got huge hands, I'd say, and he comes up to us and says, here, marine, let me help you with that. And without waiting for us to respond or warn him off, he reaches down and grabs the body bag. Then I describe how he launches up, as though he's doing a clean and jerk. He was strong. I'll give him that, I'd say. But the bag rips on the edge of the truck's back gate, and the skin of the haji tears with it. A big, jagged tear through the stomach. Rotting blood and fluid and organs slide out like groceries to the bottom of a wet paper bag. Human soup hits him right in the face, running down his mustache. If I'm telling the story sad, I can stop there. If I'm telling it funny, though, there's one more crucial bit, which Corporal G had done when he told the story to me for the first time back in 2004, before either of us had collected remains or knew what the fuck we were talking about. I don't know where G heard the story. The colonel screamed like a bitch, G had said. And then he made a weird, high-pitched keening noise deep in his throat like a wheezing dog. <laughs> this was to show us precisely how bitches scream when covered in rotting human fluids. If you get the noise right, you get a laugh. What I liked about the story 
was that even if it had happened more or less, it was still total bullshit. After our deployment, there wasn't anybody, not even Corporal G, who talked about remains that way. Some of the mortuary affairs and Marines thought the spirits of the dead hung about the bodies. It creeped them out. You could feel it, they'd say, especially when you look at the faces. But it got to be more than that. Midway through the deployment, guys started swearing they could feel spirits everywhere. Not just around the bodies and not just Marine dead. Sunni dead, Shia dead, Kurd dead, Christian dead. All the dead of all Iraq. Even all the dead of Iraqi history, the Akkadian Empire, and the Mongols, and the American invasion. I never felt any ghosts. Leave a body in the sun, the outer layer of skin detaches from the lower, and you can feel it slide around in your hands. Leave a body in water, everything swells. And the skin feels waxy and thick, but recognizably human, that's all. Except for me and Corporal G, though. Everybody in mortuary affairs talked about ghosts. We never said any different. You couldn't talk to Corporal G. He wasn't the sort. And my mom, she was freaked out enough. And Rachel, my girlfriend, wasn't my girlfriend anymore. In those days, I, I used to think maybe I'd handle it better if Rachel stayed with me. I didn't fit in at mortuary affairs, and nobody else would want to talk to me. I was from the unit that handled the dead. All of us had stains on our camis. The smell of it gets into your skin. Putting down food is hard after processing. So by the end of the deployment, we were gone from poor nutrition, sleep deprived from bad dreams, and shambling through base like a bunch of zombies. The sight of us reminding Marines of everything they know, but never discuss. And Rachel was gone. I'd, I'd seen it coming. She was a pacifist in high school, so once I signed my enlistment papers, the thing we had going went on life support. But seeing it coming isn't the same as having it happen. And she would have been perfect. She was melancholy. She was thin. She always thought about death, but she didn't get off on it like the goth kids. And I loved her because she was thoughtful and kind. Even now, I won't pretend she was especially good-looking, look, good but she listened, and there's a beauty in that that you don't often find. For my 16th birthday, she blindfolded me and drove me 20 miles out of town to a point high off the interstate where you could watch the road stretch out forever across the plains to all the places we'd rather be. She told me her gift was this, the promise to come back here with me someday and keep going. We were so close for two years, and then I signed up. It was a decision she didn't understand much more than I did. I wasn't athletic. I wasn't aggressive. I wasn't even that patriotic. Maybe if you joined the Air Force, she'd said. But I was tired of doing the weaker thing, and I didn't want to stay with her, work in a veterinarian's office, and be wistful. My ticket out of Callaway was what passed in our town for first class, the Marine Corps. I didn't want to be who I'd been anymore. I told her, what's done is done. It made me feel like a tough guy from a movie. Even still, we stayed together through boot camp. She wrote me with letters while I was there, even sent me naked photos of herself. A few weeks earlier, another guy had gotten a package like that and the D.I.s put the photos up in bathroom stalls. His girlfriend had worn a cheerleading uniform and stripped it off picture by picture. I remember thinking how glad I was that Rachel wasn't the kind of girl to send me something like that. <laughs> Mail call in boot camp works like this. One of the D.I.s stands at the front of the squad bay with all the platoon's mail while the platoon stands at attention in front of their racks. The DI calls out names one by one, and recruits run up and take their mail. If it's a package or an envelope that feels suspicious, the DI makes him open it up right there. So when I opened Rachel's letter, it was from the whole platoon and with Sergeant Kuba, my kill hat, glaring at me. This wasn't the first time I'd had to open the letter with him watching. My parents had sent me photos of their vacation to Lakeside. That was no big deal, and I hadn't been worried. I didn't think that my parents would send me naked photos. <laughs> 
Rachel's name on the envelope, though, terrified me. I opened it slowly, trying to come up with a plan if the photos turned out to be contraband. It had three glossy four by six prints that Rachel had developed herself. When I pulled them out and saw her thin, pale, and very naked body, I didn't even look up for Sergeant Kuba's reaction. I stuffed the prints into my mouth, closed my mouth, <laughs> closed my eyes, and hoped for the best. I'll stop there. <laughs>